Okay, well, having read the text, let's um, get into it, beginning with just a bit of review. And again, I want to keep the main movements, as it were, of the book in mind as we work our way through so we don't lose everything that we've uh, already seen. So the first thing that Paul showed us, remember, was that everyone is without excuse. Everyone knows that God is, either through general revelation or special revelation. And special revelation, by the way, is not just the Word of God. In the days of, of the Jews, of the days of Abraham, special revelation also included God's appearance. That was very convincing when it comes to uh, you know, having that conviction that, that God exists. So everybody knows He exists, even if He didn't appear to them from the creation. And everyone knows what He wants either through conscience, if we don't have God's law, or through, again, special revelation where he gives his law. But Paul reminded us as well that nobody actually obeys him. Remember, he says, it's not the hearers of the law who are just, but the doers who will be justified. Well, the fact is nobody actually does it, and with no obedience, he says, there is no justification. And we do need to remember this obedience has to be more than simply going through the motions. Jonathan Edwards once said, you, even in his day, you could create somewhat of, a, of a, an automated device that could do a good thing, maybe dispense food to, to people. But that doesn't make what the machine is doing good. You know, it's the motive behind it. It's not just the motions. And that's what the Lord requires of us for justification, not just doing what the right thing is formally or, you know, as far as uh, how that work is actually described, but also from the heart. One of the problems the Jews had was that their obedience was nothing more than going through the motions at best, at least among the unconverted Jews. It has to be from the heart. It has to be out of a love for God. It has to be out of a desire for His glory and not just to keep up appearances. This is what God requires. Now, in light of that standard, Paul's conclusion was, chapter 3, verse 10, there is none righteous, there is not even one. And verse 23 of chapter 3, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that's why Paul says the righteousness that we need in order to be justified, in order to be accepted by God, does not come through the law. It has to come apart from the law, apart from our efforts to obey it. Only God can provide this righteousness. And He has provided it only through His Son, through His perfect life and atoning death. And again, that's what He's going to develop throughout the book. And God alone gives it as a as a gift, basically by grace, as a free gift of His grace that we receive by faith or by trusting in Jesus Christ alone. Paul reminds us again and again that, he, that God never gave us the law as a way for us to earn our justification. He gave it to us to show us that we will never measure up to that standard so that we would look outside of ourselves to what He has provided in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, last week, Paul showed us that that's exactly what Abraham did. Remember, Abraham is the one that the Jews looked to as their spiritual father, as the example of how one is made right with God or how one is accepted by God. And they thought that God had entered into covenant with him because he was obedient to God, because he was righteous and upright. But Paul says in chapter 4, verse 3, Abraham believed and God credited it to him as righteousness. God is a God who justifies not the, the righteous, but the ungodly through faith, again, through that alien righteousness. The Jews also thought that circumcision was all they needed for God's acceptance. But their circumcision, their circumcision didn't justify them any more than our baptism justifies us. God justified Abraham while he was uncircumcised, and he gave him circumcision as a sign of the righteousness that comes from faith. It was basically a seal or God's declaration that as Abraham had believed, so he was counted righteous, and God had Abraham put this sign on his children to point them to their need of the circumcision of the heart that God gave to Abraham by his Holy Spirit that enabled him to believe. They had to look to God for that mercy, for that grace, for that change in order to trust him 
unto justification. Now, that's what we've seen so far. This morning, Paul goes on to show us uh, two more things, two main ideas. The first are the blessings that justification brings. And they may not be comprehensive, but they are perhaps the most important ones. And then he shows us the source of these blessings, showing us first where the problem came from, the first Adam, but showing us how the second Adam actually guarantees to us these blessings. Now, first of all, he shows us the blessings that justification brings. And the first and perhaps the most important is we now have peace with God. Now, this, this, I think, is something that most evangelicals really cannot understand because they may not, even as we probably didn't, and maybe we still don't, we may, we may not have thought of our relationship with God in the way the Bible actually portrays it. But before we were justified through faith in Christ, we were at war with God. Now, I don't think most evangelicals have difficulty with that idea, Paul made that point fairly clear in chapters 1 through 3. We, again, did not obey Him, did not worship Him, did not honor Him as God. Uh, even having His revelation, which many of us did growing up, we still didn't. We were at war with God. We were at enmity with God. We hated God. We didn't follow Him. We didn't honor Him. But the point they have difficulty wrapping their minds around is this, that God was also at war with us. Remember Romans chapter 1? God is pouring out His wrath daily against the wickedness, the unrighteousness of men who suppresses truth and unrighteousness, and God's giving them over to their sins. That, that is His judgment upon them. There is this warfare that is ongoing. Now, we often hear, again, from evangelical circles that God loves everyone, has a wonderful plan for your life. Okay? Well, we do know that God does love everybody with a love of benevolence. God is good to all of His creatures. He gives all the good things that everybody has, but He does not love everyone with what's called a love of complacence. He does not love what He sees in us. As a matter of fact, uh, again, uh, we're reminded in the Scriptures that God is angry with the wicked every day. As a matter of fact, Jesus points to our Heavenly Father as our example of how we are to love our enemies. And again, what he describes here is the love of benevolence that God shows the enemies with which he is at war with. Luke 6, verse 35, Jesus says, But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, which means you will be like your Heavenly Father, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Now again, people misunderstand the kindness that God shows for acceptance and love. And many evangelicals also misunderstand that, thinking that because God shows kindness and goodness and gives good gifts, that He's not angry and that He's not at war and that He's not pouring out His wrath. But that isn't the case. We were at war with God. God was at war with us. However, through justification, Paul says, this warfare has ended. You see, our relationship with God now is completely changed. No longer is He our adversary. But He loves us as a father. And no longer are we His enemies, but we love Him as His children. Now when God looks at us in the Lord Jesus Christ and sees His Son, He loves what He sees. And when we look at Him, we no longer see that one we want to put out of our minds, but now we see the one whom we love, that Holy One. We love Him for His holiness. So this is the first blessing. We have peace with God. Secondly, Paul says, instead of falling short of God's glory because of our sins, which we saw in Romans 3.23, we can now rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, which he tells us in verse 2. We can know that we will see heaven. This is where the assurance comes from. That is where His glory is displayed. And that is also where we will receive the glory that He has for us, the rewards of His grace which He gives to those who love and serve Him. Justification. How do you want to know you're going to see heaven? Justification being accepted because of Christ's righteousness, which comes through faith. That's the only way that we can know 
although we will have to also include, there have to be those fruits that flow from justification. Remember the faith of Abraham and how he held fast to God's promises, how he believed everything God said regardless of the circumstances. You know, we'll also have that working in our lives. Now, thirdly, Paul says we can rejoice in our tribulations. The difficulties that we have to face because all of these things are working together actually to increase our hope of, of heaven. Uh, we're no longer going to have to face the difficulties we face in life as the signs of God's judgment, which is what they were when we were outside of Christ. Now we can know that when these difficulties come, that He has actually brought them for our good. To produce perseverance in our lives, a steadfastness. God knows that an easy life is going to make us weak. I think we, we sang a hymn about that recently, about um, when things are going well, please save me for myself, save me for my lust, because I know during good times that's when I'm actually going to be struggling. Well, God knows that, and that's why He often brings adversity, why He brings difficulties, so that we will learn to be steadfast. As we patiently endure these difficulties, they also serve to show us what we really are. He says the, the tribulations bring proven character. And God knows what our character is, but the proof basically comes to us. We begin to see what we really are. Remember the seed that uh, fell in among the rocky soil and how it sprouted up, but as soon as the, as the sun came out, it withered away, and how in the heat of a trial, those who seem to have faith won't be able to stand because they don't have this steadfastness. Well, those who fall away don't have a genuine faith, but those who persevere show that they are genuine. It proves our character. And then Paul says that seeing the truth of our faith gives us hope. The hope that we will see God's glory because we know that this, this steadfastness that we have actually comes from the Spirit's love within our hearts, that love that never fails, which is what enables us to hold on to God and to His promises during the times of difficulties. And when we're able to do that, out of this love for Christ, we can see that we actually are true believers. So Paul begins by saying these are the blessings that flow from uh, justification, but then he strengthens our hope even further through a very convincing argument. First, he says that if God would give us his son while we were in the condition that we were in, how much more will he keep us now? that we're in Christ. He says in verse 6, for while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Paul then asks, how many are there in this world that would lay down their life for a righteous man, okay, for somebody who does the right thing, for somebody who lives an exemplary life? Paul's answer is, scarcely anyone would do that. What about for a good man? You know, for somebody who is benevolent, for somebody who shows brotherly love to other people by reaching out to them to meet their needs. He says, well, some might die for somebody like that. But what about for an unrighteous, wicked, and evil man? Okay, how many people are going to lay down their life for that person? Well, the implication is no one except God, whose love was so great that while we were in that condition, he gave His Son to die for us in order to justify us. Now, Paul reasons in this way. He says, if He was willing to pay so great a price for us when we are in this miserable state to give Jesus to die for us, how much more will He keep us now that we have been justified and now that His Son lives to intercede for us? Well, the implication is much, much more. So if He saved us while we were sinners, how much more will He keep us now that we are justified in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ? Which is why He says, forth again, we can rejoice in God through Christ who has reconciled us. We have this faith, this, this hope, this, well, this, yeah, this hope of heaven, which is not, I hope I'm going to make it kind of a hope, but hope is that which we know we're going to receive, but we haven't yet received it. We know from the promise of God we will. And all of this justification strengthens our hope that we will be with the Lord in heaven. But now Paul zeroes into the source 
of these blessings, beginning with the problem that we had to face. So first of all, he tells us that our problem came through Adam. It was through the first man, Adam, that sin entered into the world. Now, it's interesting, he wasn't the first person to sin. Remember, it was Eve. But his eating from the forbidden fruit, that was the sin that brought all of the difficulties. And we'll see why in just a moment. But the consequence, Paul says, of that sin was death. God said to Adam in Genesis 2.17, in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. And we know that what he meant by that is not just physical death. He did say to Adam, from the dust you have come and to the dust you will return. So yes, physical death is part of it. But also spiritual death. The loss of the Spirit of God brought hatred. Remember what happened to Adam after, basically after he sinned? Well, he hears God and he runs and hides himself instead of going out to meet him because of the fear of his judgment as he appears perhaps in the spirit of the day, in the spirit of wrath, he's afraid and he hides himself. But there is also now this, this alienation, this animosity in his heart, this spiritual death as well as judicial death. He knew he was under the just sentence of God's wrath. In the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. But Paul goes on to remind us that there are also consequences for us. Paul says, death also spread to all men because all sinned. Now, what does Paul mean by the fact that all sinned? Well, what he means is that when Adam sinned, as our representative, we also sinned in him. His sin was credited to us because he disobeyed God as our representative. And with that guilt, the guilt of just that one sin of disobeying God, came consequences. That's the reason why we grow old and die. Some of you are too young to really realize that yet, but you see it in those around you. We are getting older. All of us are eventually going to die because of the sin of Adam. The reason why we came into the world hating God, and that's the way that Paul represents us. There is no one who seeks after God. There is no one righteous, not even one. That's the way we came into the world. We came into the world that way because of the guilt of Adam's sin. This is what it did to us. And that is why we also come into the world under the sentence of condemnation. Guilt brings about judgment, and we are under God's judgment. Now, Paul goes on to, I think, demonstrate this, to prove this. The first thing he says is, first of all, we know that sin is not imputed where there is no law. God doesn't hold us accountable if we don't know that what we're doing is wrong. That appears to be what he means by this. But we've already seen, we all know something of what God requires, so nobody is absolutely in the dark, but I don't think that's what he has in mind here. If you'll recall, in the book of Jonah, perhaps one of the most confusing statements that, that we read in the Bible, unless we understand this, when, when God says to Jonah that he's going to show mercy to the Ninevites, to this wicked nation, he's basically asking the question, why? And of course, he gives him the plant, and the, the plant dies, and he's upset, and God's trying to teach him a lesson. You were concerned about this plant, basically for your own well-being, but why not the Ninevites? Here, here's a people who didn't know their right hand from their left. They didn't know God's law. God seemed to be overlooking, you know, not, not absolutely, but certainly overlooking the magnitude of their sins because of their ignorance of what he actually requires. But he finally did give a revelation of his will in the law on Mount Sinai through Moses. But his point is, everybody between Adam and Moses still died. Even though Adam had a commandment that he broke, and when Moses gives a set, a set of commandments, now there's a, a, there are these other commandments that we know by breaking, um, that were worthy of death, but yet everybody in between that did not have the written law, he says they all still died. Now, why did they die? Well, it's because when Adam sinned, everybody died. It was because Adam's sin was imputed to them, as it is to all of us, and that sin killed them. Now, many people object to the idea of imputation, okay, the idea that God would hold us accountable for what somebody else did. 
But again, before we respond to that, we need to remember that if we object to the idea of imputation in principle, we also destroy the gospel. Because the same principle of imputation that killed us is also the same principle that ultimately saves us through the Lord Jesus Christ. But we also need to recognize that it isn't unjust for God to put us all on trial through a representative. For one thing, this is the only way that God could have put the whole human race on trial at one time, right? Because we don't all exist at one time. Human beings procreate. And so if the whole human race was going to stand or fall at one time, it had to be through representation. Uh, some, sometimes we don't understand that there was also a trial, just like there was for Adam, there was a trial for the angels in heaven. And the trial was, you know, there's, Paul talks about the elect angels, those that didn't fall. Uh, the trial was whether or not essentially they would follow Satan or whether they would hold fast to God when Lucifer falls. And the occasion of that, Jonathan Edwards speculates, was perhaps when the Lord revealed his plan to save fallen mankind and he was going to use the angels as the servants of fallen mankind. And Satan just, or I should say Lucifer, could just, he couldn't brook that idea, his pride. And so he rebelled, and many of the angels rebelled against him. But they were all put on trial at one time because God doesn't have an, an angel factory where he continually cranks out angels. And we do know that he doesn't continue to create them, and we know they don't procreate. Jesus told us that in the resurrection we will be like the angels, neither marrying nor given in marriage. So they were all put on trial at one time, but, but you can't do that with man. So if we were to be put on trial at one time, it had to be through one man, and that man before he had any children, which is exactly what took place. Now, again, we use the same principle in our political system, don't we? Uh, we can't all govern together, although I think sometimes we like to think we can, but we really can't. So we choose people to represent us, and we do it by way of election. And when we elect somebody to office, when they make a choice... Be, if we voted for them, we're partly responsible for the choice that they make, aren't we? Because we are the ones who voted them into office. So representation, you know, we are acting through a representative. That's the same thing that happened with Adam. By the way, that should make us think very carefully. Before we vote for the lesser of two evils, okay, maybe, I don't know, think about that. Because one candidate may not be as bad as the other candidate, but if we help to put them in office through our vote... We're also partly responsible for what they do. The principle of representation means my representative. I am held accountable for what my representative does. Same thing with the hitman, remember? Um, if you hire somebody, I'm not saying you'd ever do this, but for the person who, who let's say, wants to put a hit on somebody else, this, this criminal, he hires the hitman, the hitman kills this other person, but who's responsible for it? Well, the hitman is. He pulled the trigger, but so is the guy who hired him the guy he represents. Okay, so representation, we're familiar with that. Adam represented us. We're responsible for what he did. Now, we might object that we didn't vote for Adam, okay? That, that's true, we, we certainly didn't, but we also need to remember that Adam was as good as any mere man could possibly be. And if we had been there in the same condition as Adam, we would have done exactly the same thing. Because no mere human being, even a sinless one, could have resisted Satan. Okay? The good news is God gave somebody else who could. Okay? Another representative, he gave the God-man. Jonathan Edwards believes, and I think he's right, that one of the reasons why Jesus had to be both God and man is because no mere creature could withstand the devil and could do what was necessary. And certainly could never lay down his life for a multitude of people uh, paying for infinite sins. He had to be infinite in his worth, but he had to be the God-man to resist the temptations of the evil one. Paul tells us in verse 14 that Adam was a type or a picture of the one who was coming. As our representative, Adam killed us. He condemned us through the one choice that he made. He made us all sinners. But the second Adam, through his obedience, brought life. He took our guilt, our condemnation, all the sins that we had committed on himself, and he died in our place so that through his death 
we would be made righteous or just in Him. Paul tells us in, in these verses where he's describing the, the two federal heads, the two covenant heads, the two Adams. One brings death, the other one brings life. Now, one question we need to address in this text is this. Does, is Paul here teaching universalism? He says, on the one hand, Adam condemned us all through his one act, but on the other hand, Christ justified everyone by his one act of obedience. Is Paul telling us everyone is going to be saved? You know, there are people who believe that. But if you read the rest of the Bible, and we do have to do that to understand any portion of the Bible, we, we can see it clearly isn't the case. Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, a very sobering passage, Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. I think Jesus is telling us here that there's going to be more who are lost, much more who are lost than are saved. Paul is not teaching universalism, but what he is saying is this, that everyone that Adam represented, the entire human race, except for Jesus Christ, who was virgin born for a reason, was condemned in him. And everyone Jesus represented, which would be all of his sheep, all of his elect, everyone ultimately who trusts in him by the grace of God, will be made righteous and justified in Him. That's the reason why I read as our meditation, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Now finally, Paul reminds us why God again gave the law at Sinai. You'll notice as we're going through here, he keeps breaking in with the gospel and he keeps breaking in with the well, explanations of why the law was not meant for this because of the Jewish congregation that he is writing to a, a large constituency of them are Jewish. As a matter of fact, I'm beginning to think as I go through the book of Romans, the majority of them likely were, although some commentators believe that what, from what Paul said in chapter 1 that perhaps the majority of them were Gentiles, because he wanted to come and minister the gospel among them so he might have fruit among them just as he does around, among the rest of the Gentiles, he says. But yet Paul again and again is addressing the Jews. So here again he addresses why did God give the law again? He says in verses 20 and 21, not to justify us, but that our sins might become more obvious so that we would see more clearly our need for God's grace, okay? The law is not meant to justify us. We can't be saved through our obedience. It has to come through Christ. The law was given, as Paul argues in Galatians, to teach us of our need of Christ. The whole ceremonial law was meant to teach us of our need of Christ. The moral law was given to us to show us that we fall short when we measure ourselves by it. It shows us that we need a righteousness that we can't gain through our own obedience. We need Christ. Now that, in, in conclusion, is why we should read the Ten Commandments more often. You know, not only to remind us of God's will for our lives, what He saved us to become. Remember, in the New Covenant, He writes the law in our hearts so that we'll do these things, so that we'll become more like Jesus, right? We should read it for that reason. But we should also read them because of, you know, it's a reminder to us of just how indebted we are uh, to the Lord for giving us His Son to take our punishment, to give us a righteousness that measures up to this law, and to give us the strength to obey it. Remember, God saved us so that we would obey Him. As we prepare to come to the table, let, let's be reminded of the things that we've seen this morning, of the blessings that flow from justification, the blessing of peace, with God, that hope of heaven, the sanctification that strengthens that hope of heaven. And let's um, also, as we come to the table, um, let's thank Him that these blessings have come through what the table actually represents, 
through the obedience of his son. Remember what, what we're looking at here uh, in Romans 5. Paul keeps referring. Okay, the one thing that Adam did is he disobeyed that one commandment, not to eat of the tree. But Jesus, through one act of righteousness, has justified us. What act of righteousness is that? Well, it's his laying his life down for us. And, and the entire work of Christ, again and again in the Bible, gets summarized by his offering himself as an atonement. And that's what the table is reminding us of this morning, that all of these blessings come from him and from him alone. Our acceptance with God, our peace with God, our hope of heaven, it all comes from him as well as the strength we need to be able to obey and serve him out of thankfulness for the mercies that he has given to us. So with that in mind, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to prepare us to come to the table to celebrate these things, to praise him and thank him, but also to look to him for continued strength to, well, to live the kind of life that Abraham lived, that David lived, that we read about in the saints, that trust in the Lord not just for their salvation, but also for their lives, that they might serve and honor Him in this life.